Hello, my name's James Smallwood and welcome to my garden here in Bushy in Hertfordshire. I'd like to talk to you today about my passion in gardening and that is growing auriculars. I've grown them for over 15 years now and for some of that time I was very fortunate to be able to work with a gentleman by the name of Bill Lockyer and Bill was well known for his wonderful displays of auriculars at shows like Chelsea and he won four consecutive gold medals there which really takes some doing. Very sadly Bill passed away after a short illness in 2016 but his son Simon managed to carry on with the business and my wife and I occasionally go down to the nursery to help Simon and his partner Louise and of course we work at uh, many of the shows like uh, Chelsea, Hampton Court, Harrogate, Chatsworth and so on. But of course they've all been cancelled this year as have my talks to gardening clubs and societies. So I hope you'll enjoy this uh, short video today where I'm going to share some tips with you on how to grow these beautiful flowers. Now the auricula is a member of the Primula genus and it grows high up in the Alps, the Pyrenees and the Dolomites. That's its native habitat and it is a fully hardy plant. I grow mine in pots and during the winter time they actually freeze solid in those pots uh, but it doesn't do them any harm whatsoever. Now people often say to me, James, well why the auricula? Why that particular plant as opposed to any other? Well, I, I guess we all love to see um, a mass display of blooms, whether that be uh, spring bulbs, snowdrops, or carpet of daffodils, or perhaps it's a, a beautiful wisteria growing on the side of a house. Or maybe it's something really simple, like a field of buttercups spread out before you. And certainly a mass display of blooms like that is a sight to behold. But I just ask you, when was the last time you stopped and looked, and looked in real detail, close up, at a single flower, and admired its structure, its colour, its texture, and even of course its scent, and many auriculars are quite scented. Now the auricula has um, a coating on some parts of the plant which is called farina and other primulas have farina on them but none to the same extent as the auricula where it plays a really important role in its appearance and I liken it to at Christmas time when you get the mince pies out and you give them a dusting with icing sugar that's very similar to the same effect that you have with the farina on the primulas. And if you were to take your finger across the surface, you would of course get a coating of this farina. And it can occur on any part of the plant. It can be on the leaves, on the stem, on the calyx, on the back of the flower, and even on the flower itself. And when you get a really dense coating of the farina on the flower, it's known as paste and the contrast between the white paste and the petals can often cause a really fantastic contrast which gives the auricula a lot of its beauty. Now as I've mentioned the native auricula is an alpine plant and you can see in this photograph that uh, it has a beautiful deep yellow colour. But auriculas today come in a whole variety of colours and uh, it wasn't until about the 1760s that we actually started to discover how this came about. And this was a, an Austrian botanist who was a keen alpinist and he was climbing one day in the mountains near his home in uh, Innsbruck and he came across the auricula growing there and nearby he came across another primula and this one is called Primula Hyacinta. And you think, well, so what? There's nothing unusual about that. Well, in fact, the Primula Auricula prefers to grow on 
alkaline soil. So limestone, things like that. Whereas the Primula hyacinta prefers to grow on acidic soil. So granite and shale. And geology had created this area, this landmass, where the two rocks were close together and the two types of Primula were growing close to each other. And what happened was that they kind of got to know each other and uh, met up and uh, they fell in love and uh, got married, had a family and lived happily ever after. Well, of course, that's the story. In fact, what they did was to cross-pollinate and they produced a range of primula, which we call primula pubescens. And these are the, the parents, or grandparents, if you like, of all modern day auriculas. And they come in a range of colors. So you might ask yourself, how did it come about that we have this fantastic range of auriculas in such a, a wide range of different colors? Well, Primula hirsuta has got a pigment called hyacinthin in it. And this reacts to acid and alkaline a little bit like the old litmus paper at school. And that pigment is similar to a pigment which is contained in something you'll be familiar with called a red cabbage. And that pigment called anthocyanin reacts in the same way. So you will all be familiar with the fact that uh, when you look at a red cabbage, it isn't actually red, it's purple, which of course is a, a cross between, a, a combination of colours of red and blue. If of course you put it into vinegar, into acid, then you get that red colour, and equally if you put it into an alkaline solution, it will turn blue. And if you think about it, with the native yellow Primula auricula, and now the potential for this red and blue, we've got the perfect artist's palette because we've got the three primary colours. So let's move on now to having a look at the classification for auriculars uh, and this is quite important if you want to grow them. And they fall basically into four categories. We have got borders, alpines, doubles and shows. And the shows themselves are subdivided into four further categories of selves, edges, fancies and stripes. Now, don't worry, you won't have to remember this. It's quite simple. Now, I've put a, a dotted line on the diagram because the shows have got much more of that farina. And uh, when I do my talks, I mention a, a record by chap called Richard Harris back in the 19 whatevers and uh, it was called MacArthur Park and there was a line in that song which said someone left a cake out in the rain. Now if you think back to those mince pies beautifully coated in icing sugar if you left one of those out in the rain it would spoil very quickly. Well similarly with the show auriculars they need a bit of protection from the worst of the weather otherwise the farina will be spoiled. So today I'm not going to talk about the shows and just concentrate on the other three varieties, the borders, the alpines and the doubles. So let's have a look first at the border auriculars. These are, if you like, your common or garden auriculars that were very very popular years ago, certainly in the Victorian times and when I've worked at the shows I've had people come up to me and say, oh, my grandmother used to grow these. They used to grow up the side of the path and she used to rip them up because they were like weeds. And this is probably the easiest of the auriculas to grow. And you can plant them in borders or in troughs or in tubs, pretty much anywhere. And they are a good, robust plant. The only thing, or the only two things that they need are a bit of protection from the worst of the heat in the summer and good drainage as we shall see fairly shortly. So not long after Bill had passed away Simon found a jar of seeds in the fridge and these seeds had been collected by Bill 
and uh, Simon sent them off to a professional propagator and ended up with about 11,000 of these beautiful multicoloured border auriculars. And we'll show you a few now. They do come in a, a whole range of different colours. As you'll see, here's one called Border Band Bandit in a, a range of yellows and oranges. Eden Greenfinch, and you can just see a little bit of that farina around the centre of the flower. And this one, which is called Dale's Red, and was bred by an American called Dale Worthington back in 1954. And uh, you can see there now this thicker paste in the centre, which gives a really, really amazing contrast with the beautiful red in the petals. This one called Blue Velvet, which is a bit of a throwback to the times when people would name plants according to either their appearance or of their use. And if you see this one close up, it really does look like blue velvet. So those are the border auriculars, and we now move on to the alpines. And the alpines have a couple of distinguishing features. Firstly, there are two different classes. There are what we call light-centred and gold-centred. And also, all of the alpines have got no farina and the petals are always shaded from dark to light, as you will see. So the first of those is this one here, which is called Stella South. And this was bred by a gentleman by the name of Dave Skinner, who lives up in the north. And uh, Dave used to work for the electricity board, and many of his auriculars are named after power stations. This is one of mine, which uh, I showed at the uh, Northern Society show in Cheadle, Manchester, uh, last year. And it won the best in class and uh, a trophy, uh, of which I'm very, very proud. Another light centred is Argus. And this one is a very, very old plant. It's been around since the sort of 1890s, but still produces some wonderful, wonderful blooms. Rabley Heath, and if you ever travel up the A1 and you're anywhere near Welling Garden City, you'll go past Rabley Heath. We move then on to the gold-centred alpines. Uh, Blythe Spirit, again another one of Dave Skinner's, and again named after a power station. Beautiful contrast again between the gold centre and the dark colour of the petals. Sirius, which is a, a favourite in the Smallwood household, uh, unusual colourway with the cream petals and again contrasting with that dark crimson colour at the edge and the gold centre. And I always say to people if you are a, a fan of Johnny Cash then you'd have to have Ring of Fire in your collection. So those are the Alpines and we move now on to the doubles. And the doubles were very, very popular at the turn of the last century, so the early 1900s, but then by about the 1930s, 40s, they'd all but disappeared. Like many flowers and plants, they just fell out of fashion. However, some dedicated breeders reintroduced them, and thank goodness they did, because we now have a wonderful range of doubles. And again, they come in a whole range of different colours, and the petal formation on these can vary from something quite simple like a, a camellia to very, very complex petal formation like an old English rose. And again, a wonderful, wonderful array of uh, colours and contrasts. This one called brimstone and treacle. Just a very, very light dusting of that farina on the petals. Uh, and this one, which is a, a real favourite uh, and always brings, uh, brings out a few exclamations of surprise in the audience, uh, called Sarah Gisby. Again, a, a totally stunning plant. Now, this one was bred by somebody who clearly wanted to name it in accordance with its characteristics. And I can tell you that it is a, a very, very demanding plant. It's very high maintenance, very difficult to get it to do what you want it to do. Yes, it's named after my dear wife, Nicola. 
and uh, in fact this was the very last plant that Bill named before he left with us so a, a great honour for us to have uh, an auricula named after my dear wife Nicola. So those are the doubles and I'd like to move now on to growing auriculas and to share a few practical tips with you. It's uh, suddenly turned rather windy today in the garden so I've moved into a, a more sheltered spot. Let's go through a few of the things that you're going to need in order to grow some auriculas. And first and foremost of course you're going to need some plants. Now these can be obtained from a number of specialist growers which you can find on the internet or you can join one of the three societies. There is the Northern Midlands and West and the Southern Societies, they all have shows and annual general meetings and there are always plants available to buy, very very inexpensive. If you go to your local nursery you're unlikely to be able to find named varieties and uh, these will just have been grown from seed and uh, as I say you, you won't get a named variety usually from an ordinary nursery. So, as well as plants, I want to talk to you about uh, different pots and, of course, most important, compost. And uh, that is something which a lot of people think is a bit of a mystery, but actually it's very straightforward. Auriculas will usually be in flower from about mid-March through until the end of May. So, the end of the Chelsea Flower Show normally signals pretty much the end of the flowering season. You can get a second flush in the autumn, um, but a lot really depends upon the weather uh, as to exactly when they're going to come into flower. And that makes it quite a challenge, obviously, for anybody who wants to show auriculas um, at any of the, uh, the major shows. So this plant has uh, finished flowering, and uh, I'm now going to show you what we need to do in order to repot it. So when it comes to repotting auriculas, we normally repot them each year and you've got a choice as to when you do that. You can either repot them as soon as they finish flowering, so end of May, early June, or you can wait until the autumn, September time, when the heat of the summer has passed. Two schools of thought, some people feel it's better to repot early because they've got longer to grow. Others feel the plants stand a better chance of getting through the summer if you wait to repot till later. I'm going to repot this one now so you can see. And uh, I'm just going to knock it out of the pot. Make a bit of a mess on the table. And then just gently tease the soil out. And what you'll find, you've got a good good root system on this plant look um, and what you'll find is that we've got a number of what we call offsets and all you need to do is to just very gently tease these away from the main plant and those will then give you providing they've got some root and that one's got some root on it there those will give you a new plant if it leaves a, a wound, then it's best to dress that with a bit of flowers of sulphur just to make sure that you don't get any infections in there. Um, you'll notice that some of the leaves have gone a little bit brown and dead. That's quite normal on auriculas and uh, it can happen throughout the year, um, most often in the autumn. Um, and all you need to do is to just gently tear them down, take them off, And so from that one plant there, look, I've now got three. Um, so this is great and very easy to propagate. And those will give you an exact replica of the parent plant. If you get auricula seeds, then those will be the result of cross-pollination, usually between two different plants, so you're never quite sure what you're going to get. Whereas the offsets, you can absolutely guarantee that they will be the same as the parent plant. And this is a, uh, an alpine, a light-scented alpine called amethyst. 
And so I'm now going to repot the uh, the offsets. And you have a choice between using old-fashioned terracotta pots, which of course are, are, are very nice but not easy to get hold of. They do also damage with the frost. Um, or you can use plastic pots. And I know there's a lot of people who are against using plastic. The good thing about the plastic pots is that they are much, much easier to keep clean. And of course, you can use them over and over again. Terracotta pots are easier in terms of the watering because the water will tend to leach out of the pot more easily, whereas they can become a little bit waterlogged in a plastic pot. So you have to be a little bit careful. So let's repot one now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a bit of horticultural grit in the bottom of my pot. And this is just a, a fine grit. And that just really helps with the drainage. And I take my offset and I'm going to pop it into the pot. Just a, a small square pot with some compost. And this compost is very straightforward. It's an equal mixture of John Innes number two and a multi-purpose compost and some grit. And that will give you a really good medium for growing your auriculars. So there we are, potted up. And then I just uh, give it some water there is a school of thought that says you're, you're better to water from underneath rather than above, uh, but I do both. It depends on how much time I've got because it's a little bit more time consuming to uh, water them from below. Um, but as I said, we repot them each year and there are a number of reasons for that. The first, as you've just seen, is it gives you a chance to multiply your plants and get some offsets. But also it's an opportunity to check for any pests and diseases. The, uh, the main pest is vine weevil and uh, that will eat the roots and uh, you can end up with a very sick plant that has got no roots on it at all. Sometimes you get a bit of root aphid um, or woolly aphid around the collar but those are usually easily treated um, and if you want um, if you want a really eco-friendly way of treating it, if you just take it and you put it under a, a running tap and you take a very soft brush, I've got a, um, a brush that's made from goat hair, it's called a, a soft face pony brush available from a, a tack shop and uh, you just simply brush off the uh, offending articles and uh, don't do it in a bucket because they will reinfest but if you do it under a running tap then absolutely fine. And of course it also gives you a chance when you're repotting to replenish the compost and to feed the plant. So let's finish off with a quick guided tour. We have some border auriculars over here in pots and they're in pots because we're hoping to move house fairly shortly so I don't want to have to dig them up to uh, take them. And then as we move around This is where I have most of my show auriculars and uh, these are all at the moment in a state where they are waiting to be repotted. So there you have it and uh, I hope you've enjoyed this short video and that it will encourage you to have a go at growing these beautiful plants. Auriculars really should come with a health warning because <coughs> I started off just with a a handful of plants, half a dozen plants and a, and a keen interest but uh, I've probably now got over 500 plants so uh, it's become uh, a little bit of an obsession. Thanks for watching.